This tank behind me is the IS, or often known as JS, Joseph Stalin III tank. And it's actually here at the Tank Museum, here in the summer of 2018, because it's come over on loan uh, from the Belgium military collection, uh, and it normally lives at Bastogne. Uh, it's over here for our Tank Fest event, and it gives us an opportunity to do a bit of a tank chat on this, uh, this vehicle and the family of vehicles it comes from. What happens in World War II, we all know about the T-34, the Russian heavy tank at the same time was the KV-1. And the KV-1 was much more expensive and more complicated to make than the T-34 tank. And it didn't take long before they realised actually it has the same gun, in other words, the same 76mm gun on both tanks. So the firepower was the same. So they thought, let's up the firepower on the KV-1, otherwise really it's redundant. So they take the 85 millimetre gun and put that on the chassis of the KV-1. And that becomes the first in the Joseph Stalin family of tanks. They only make just over 100 or so of those before they realise they can also fit that 85 millimetre gun on the larger turret that goes on the T-34. So again, this first model of the Joseph Stalin tank becomes redundant. It'll have the same firepower yet again as the T-34. So they make a second model, the JS or IS-2. That sees action in the Second World War and it's a very different tank because they've managed to fit the DT-20 gun onto it, which is a huge 122 millimetre gun. Now they carry on developing that vehicle and they come up with this, the IS-3. Now the IS-3 does not see service in World War II, but it is seen at the Victory Parade in September of 1945, uh, when the 71st Guards uh, Division, they parade it through Berlin and it puts a worry through the Western Allies. Just at this time, the Cold War is beginning uh, East and West are not getting on and the appearance of this tank really frightens the Allies and it leads to Britain starting the Conqueror program and it leads in America to the idea of the M103, uh, the su huge super heavy tanks which are going to be there to support things like the M47, the M48 or in the British case the Centurion tanks which they simply didn't think would be able to take on the thick armour on an IS-3. So even though this tank doesn't see much in the way of action, it's actually a very influential tank into that Cold War period. So what was different about it? I've mentioned that huge gun, 122 millimetre. It's such a big gun, they could only carry 28 rounds inside the vehicle. Two part ammunition, uh, they'd normally carry about 20 high explosive rounds and eight armour piercing rounds inside this. And again, even the high explosive round, because the gun's so big, that would have a tremendous blast effect if it is fired at an enemy tank. If you're firing the armour piercing round, 2,500 metres away, they still manage to penetrate the front armour of a Panther, and that's a really long range. That gun, that DT-20 gun, uh, has got about seven times uh, the energy when it fires around as the original T-34 76mm gun. So it is a real step change in terms of firepower. Now the problem about this tank, thick armour are angled on the front, new frying pan shaped turret. Um, they're designing this new type of turret as well, uh, very similar with the T-54 that again is being designed about the same sort of time. Um, the problem with that is it limits the space inside the vehicle. Great ballistically that shape, helps deflect rounds, um, but inside that vehicle crew conditions are appalling. Um, and again, back to the idea that the Russians, don't forget, are a dictator, uh, dictatorship with Stalin in charge, no arguments. Uh, if you don't like the crew conditions, you're off finding mines on the Eastern Front, you know, with your feet. So um, absolutely abysmal uh, for the crew inside there. They only allow people five foot eight maximum height to go inside a vehicle like this. So again, size is limited in terms of the crewman. Because of that space in there, because of the two-part ammunition, um, they're down to normally firing initially one to two rounds a minute. 
they manage to up that with some improvements, maybe three or four rounds a minute. They continue to be developed. The one again that frightens the West is the T10 tank in the same family. And again, that was one of the tanks that, uh, from the Western Allies' point of view, NATO countries um, end up getting very frightened about the T10 as well because of the firepower and the very thick armour on the front. This pointy front leads the Russians uh, to call this tank, they have a nickname, the Pike. Uh, it's about 46 tonnes, so it's relatively light still. Um, it's still lighter than actually uh, a Panther tank that, again, when it was being built, they're looking at the Panther, they're looking at the Tiger I and then the King Tiger. Those are the sort of tanks this is built originally in its design process to deal with, even though it never actually fights against them. Uh, and again, it's a tank that's exported. A hundred are sold to Egypt and they see a little bit of action in some of the Middle Eastern wars. Again, not that successfully because the Egyptians tended to dig them in or use them as static defensive positions rather than using the mobility uh, that the tank brings. Um, they are seen in the Prague Spring, spring. they're seen in use in Hungary, uh, again much more in the sense of, uh, of looking as an uh, oppressive weapon, you know, turning up on the streets with a tank like this, um, it, it shows you sort of mean business again, so it's that tanks in the uh, civil situation, they have a, an ominous presence. Um, but again, they were retired from service much later on. A lot of the Russian kit is kept in reserve much longer than Western nations do. Uh, now out of service all around the world, although interestingly, one was reactivated recently in the Ukraine, um, which led the Ukrainians to actually try and uh, make sure that all their gate guard or memorial tanks around the place couldn't be used because back to, why was it reactivated? Back to that basic Russian skill of making a vehicle reliable, um, there for the long term and simple. So getting one of these going again wasn't that hard uh, for some of these Ukrainian rebels. Um, so a very interesting tank from our point of view. Obviously as you're looking at it, gun facing to the rear at the moment, it's in the lock, ready to be first of all washed down and then loaded. And thank you so much to our friends at uh, the Belgian military collection who've allowed that vehicle to come across to us and allowed us to show it to you.